Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen English. Welcome to Unicon's U Portal Support Quarter Two Briefing. Again, my name is Stephen English. I am the program manager for U Portal Support and also a project manager for a multitude of U Portal implementations that we uh, currently work on. Um, I would like to go ahead and introduce our team and discuss some housekeeping items, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So most of you know our old, what I like to name as our old stable horses, uh, Drew Will and Benito Gonzalez, who has recently been named as an Aperio Fellow and has been recognized for a decade of contributions that he's made to the Aperio Foundation. Um, we've also got Christian Murphy here. He's our UX guru and is uh, quickly becoming a heavy contributor to our Aperio community and recognized for his um, input here as a recent. Um, we have a couple of newcomers to the team. Uh, one is Chris Beach. He's the new guy on the block. And we have Seema Talil, and she'll be with the UPortal team until the end of September. So I'd like to welcome those folks. A couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, please mute your microphone and post any questions that you may have to the chat room. And then we'll answer those questions at the end of our presentation. out of the screen here. All right, so let's cover our briefing agenda real quick. Um, we'll be covering uPortal start overview, um, open Aperio 2017 recap. We'll cover our sustaining engineering endeavors that we've completed over Q1 and look forward to the, I'm sorry, Q2 and look forward to what we'll be completing in Q3. Our community spotlight for this quarter is um, University of Edinburgh. Um, with Marissa um, that will be moderating their piece of um, and highlighting some of the work that they've done over the past quarter. And then again, we'll wrap it up with a Q&A session. Um, and again, please post any comments that you have to the chat room. We'll be logging those comments and then we'll be um, answering those questions at the end of the presentation. Mind you that we may run over five to 10 minutes just with the amount of content that we have to present. So. Um, we will be sensitive to everyone's time and try to complete on time, but we do have, we do think that we'll run over five minutes or so. So without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to Drew Wills. All right, uh, this is Drew. Can someone indicate uh, if you can hear me? Yes, sir. Awesome, excellent, I'm on. All right, uh, so my portion in this, I'm gonna talk about uPortal Start a bit. Uh, I think a lot of you know already uh, a bit about uPortal Start, uh, but it may be the case that some of you don't, haven't really heard about it. Uh, uPortal Start is a separate repo from the main uh, uPortal Git repository in GitHub. This is the top of the README page uh, for the uPortal Start repo. It's actually a pretty good Read me pretty useful has kind of cookbook information for how to work with you portal start uh, Next slide, please At any rate you portal start it's it's the intended way to adopt you portal 5 uh, again many of you will be aware that we're cooking a, a uPortal 5 right now. We hope to be, uh, to have a, a, a GA release uh, sometime around the end of October, give or take. You know, these things are never certain. Uh, we hope to be in kind of an RC release candidate phase in a little over a month. Uh, but at any rate, the way that you work with uh, uPortal 5 and the way that you work with uPortal Start, locally you want to fork the uPortal Start repo, not the main uPortal repo, or I should say typically not the main uPortal repo. It is still perfectly viable to fork uh, uPortal, you know, the main uPortal content itself and to um, you know, add features uh, or fix things or, or alter the behavior of that repo. It is completely plausible and viable, but we believe with uPortal 5 that it will not be necessary. Uh, uPortal Start 
uh, contains the things that makes that turns uPortal technology into your campus portal or your application, whatever it is, even if it isn't a campus portal. So it contains, uPortal Start contains and helps you manage your configuration, your skin, and your data. Uh, these are the, the elements, you know, at a, at a high level, at a basic level, these are the elements that are different about your uPortal adoption as compared with uPortal vanilla direct from Aperio or someone else's uPortal adoption. uPortal Start also includes a suite of CLI tools, command line interface tools, to manage these items. They are similar to but better than the CLI tools in uPortal 4 uh, in the previous versions of uPortal. Uh, they help you manage configuration, they, they help you manage your data, they help you manage your skin, and they help you package a, a uPortal deployment that includes your configuration. Uh, you, you, will build, uh, you will build using your fork of uPortal start, and by the way, that is lightning fast, uh, a few seconds, it's... Um, a quarter of the time or better, I'd say, as compared with building uPortal 4. And Aperio or the uPortal uh, community of uPortal developers, we will build and periodically release new versions of the core uPortal technology, which you can bring into uPortal Start by reference. This is this separation is the source of the majority, not all, but the majority of uh, the, the time improvements, uh, the build time improvements. Uh, in uPortal 4 and uPortal 3, you were required to, to build the whole universe of uPortal technology locally on, on your own machine, and of course that takes time. With uPortal 5, the things that you're not changing are built and released by a perio to Maven Central and you incorporate them in your uPortal package and in your uPortal deployment by reference. Uh, there is a question in the chat, is uPortal 5 officially released? I, I did kind of mention it but um, it looks like we're looking at kind of end of October, give or take, uh, for an official release. However, Unicon is working with clients to adopt uPortal 5 right now. uPortal 5 is in a state where it is feasible. Uh, if you are ambitious and an early ad adopter, feasible to implement uPortal 5 right now. Uh, last bullet on this slide, uPortal Start, as well as the main uPortal repo, now have a 100% Gradle-based build system. Gone are Ant and Maven. There is no build XML nor pom.xml uh, in the root directory or really any directory. Uh, the build is entirely Gradle based. Uh, Gradle is, for one thing, very fast. So some of the uh, speed improvements to the build uh, stem from that. Uh, for another thing, the Gradle build system is very modern and it suits the things that we're doing with uh, well especially with CLI tools and the things that we're doing with building and managing you portal really quite well uh, next slide please oh my goodness this got animated yeah I would think I was animated enough uh, at any rate so implementing uh, uPortal 5 with uPortal Start is remarkably streamlined versus previous versions of uPortal. You will get a sense of that if you glance through the uPortal Start README, that document that I talked about at the very beginning uh, of my part. But you can also get a sense for that, I think, by considering this, by looking at this recipe for getting uPortal Start working uh, on your local machine uh, and 
in your head comparing it to uh, the process you went through to do the same for you portal four or for you portal three uh, if you had a brand new laptop a brand new machine and you needed to get uh, you portal running on it these are the steps you would need to follow you need a JDK same as as ever you need to install Java a JDK you portal 5 requires JDK 8 uh, don't forget to set up a Java home environment variable it's required uh, for I think it's required for Tomcat, but at the end of the day, it's required uh, for the um, uh, for everything to work. You will need uh, <clears throat> I I submit to you that you will need to install Git. The only sensible way to work with you portal and work with you portal start is to do it through Git. So you will need to install uh, a local Git client. But once you have those two prerequisites. Uh, you can clone the uPortal start repo, which is at this URL, uh, cd into the directory it creates, of course, and run uh, one command to do everything. Uh, it, it's called portal init. And then uh, at that point, your entire portal will be built and deployed. Your database will be running. Your database schema will be created and all of the default data will be imported into the schema. Uh, the only thing that won't be running at that point is Tomcat. So you have to run a, you have to do a Tomcat start command. Uh, that will start up Tomcat and from there you can uh, access your local portal straight away. Yes, uh, Tobin asked about HSQL. Uh, the um, the portal init command spins up the uh, the embedded hypersonic database uh, automatically. Uh, next slide, please. The this is a um, list of more of additional Gradle commands. Well, sort of a complete list of of Gradle tasks. And, uh, it, you know, we saw two of them already on the previous slide. We saw portal init, which I've highlighted uh, in uh, kind of reddish orange. Uh, and uh, we also saw Tomcat start. There's, there's a Tomcat stop command. There are, or task, I should say. There are tasks as well to start and stop hypersonic. Uh, as I mentioned, HSQ will start. Uh, is included in Portal Init. There are several things included in Portal Init. One of them is HSQL start. Another one is uh, Portal or sorry Tomcat uh, install. I should cover this. Uh, in previous versions of uPortal, you were obligated to go to uh, the Apache Tomcat website and download a copy of the appropriate version of Tomcat. Uh, you were obligated to install it locally and uh, configure some very important things like the um, uh, shared loader uh, class path setting, um, session cookie path equals slash. Uh, you were obligated to uh, set the memory settings uh, manually. Uh, uPortal start does all that for you. It pulls down a version of Tomcat uh, from Maven Central uh, and it installs it locally within your sort of uPortal start environment. It configures all those mandatory settings for you and it deploys, and, and just like uPortal 4 and 3, it deploys the shared class path uh, jar files to the um, appropriate place. It's, you know, slash shared slash lib, if I remember correctly. Uh, so it gets Tomcat entirely ready to go for you through the Tomcat install command, which, by the way, you can run again uh, repeatedly to reset Tomcat to a fresh state if you want to. Uh, more uh, Gradle tasks. Uh, there is a brand new Gradle task called Portal Open. If you run that from the command line, it will launch a browser uh, pointed to localhost 8080 slash uPortal. Uh, so you don't even have to remember the URL where 
uh, where you can access uPortal running locally on your machine. Uh, we have the same import-export capabilities that you are familiar with. We have data init, which drops, recreates, and reloads the, U -portal, data, the portal database. Uh, we have data import, data export, data <laughs> They work very similarly to previous versions. Also data list, uh, possibly a lesser known um, import export capability, uh, but uh, one that existed in uPortal 4 for sure. We have that. We have a variety of things we can do to manipulate uh, the integrated Tomcat. Uh, I mentioned we can reinstall Tomcat. We can also stop and start Tomcat. Uh, Tomcat deploy is very cool. It's a uh, Gradle task that is, it, it, unlike Tomcat start, which is a task that's attached to the root of the uh, project, uh, Tomcat deploy is actually a Gradle task that's attached to each module. So you can run Tomcat deploy at the root and it will deploy all the modules, or you can run Tomcat deploy on an individual module to deploy only one. So you can deploy a bundled portlet in seven or eight seconds, uh, possibly. Uh, all right, there are many cool tools uh, in uPortal Start. Can I get the next slide? Uh, some highlights of some reasons why working with uPortal Start is better. Uh, some of which I've touched upon, but you don't, you, in uPortal 4 and 3, you are obligated to install not one, but two Java-based build tools. You were obligated to install Ant and Maven, and typically you needed to get the versions right. There would be versions of Ant and Maven that would work and some that wouldn't. In uPortal Start, you are obligated to install none of that. Uh, we use Gradle. You're not even obligated to install Gradle because we've included a Gradle wrapper in the project. So uh, uPortal Start comes with Gradle. Uh, uPortal Start installs and configures Tomcat for you. Uh, it, you know, I've been on the portal uh, user list for many years, and every year I help a handful of individuals uh, deal with their shared class loader and other Tom, initial Tomcat uh, startup. Uh, configuration issues and using your portal start, it just takes care of that for you. Uh, the build.properties file is not required in your portal start. It still exists. You can use it to override default settings, but it's not required. Uh, in your portal start, you can run any task, any build or deploy task, or even a database uh, import export task directly on a submodule. Uh, without having to run it on the entire uh, project. Uh, that was a, a, a non-existent but desired feature in uPortal 4, and now we have it, uh, the ability to deploy a single uh, bundled portlet. Uh, all data has been moved to the data directory, which is right under the root. It includes the portal uh, database entities, XML entity files, as well as portlet, like newsreader and calendar, uh, XML entity files, um, all organized into subfolders together uh, for, for easy finding. Uh, and uh, builds in uh, uPortal Start are remarkably fast. Uh, it is you know, it was not uncommon to have two or three minute build times, depending on what you're doing in uh, uPortal 4, and that kind of thing is a thing of the past. Uh, the builds are very fast. All right, I'm concerned I may have used too much time. Uh, let's move to the next slide. All right, that's me, folks. All right, hey, thanks, Drew. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, uh, everybody. This is Benito. Um, I'm going to just uh, go over the conference, my experiences, and uh, highlight some of the uh, uPortal uh, events, activities uh, that happened during uh, the conference. Um, it was a great conference in Philly and um, had a blast. So uh, first thing to talk about is kind of the workshops 
uh, there was three specifically geared towards U Portal, uh, my UW for You uh, workshop edition. So uh, Andrew Petro uh, talking about uh, their U Portal and U Portal Home, uh, which is an Angular JS based front end that sits in front of their portal. Uh, I, I was supposed to give a workshop on getting started with U Portal 5, uh, but wow, I got hit with a bug and I could barely speak. So thanks, Drew, for stepping in. Uh, he's generally done this workshop over the past several years. So he just walked in and, and handled it. Uh, a big uh, thank you. Uh, let's see, and also he covered developing soffits for U Portal 5. If you're not familiar with soffits, we talked about it in the last briefing or two. And certainly something we brought up at the conference. Uh, soffits are a, a, another technology so that you don't have to build full-blown portlet with all the old archaic approaches of portlets. Uh, soffits are modern, new, and are uh, much more independent from the from U portal. And we can talk about that. Um, in another venue, and certainly you can ask questions about it over the mailing list or contact us. Let's see. Uh, the one thing I do want to stress, go go, ahead, go back to the workshops, please. In the previous slide, yeah. Just one thing I wanted to stress is that, um, here we go, we're getting synced up here just a second. The one thing I wanted to stress about the workshops was that even if you are comfortable with the subject, uh, consider attending a workshop at the beginning of the conference. If you're going to the conference, there's lots of details that are covered since it's a three hour presentation. Uh, you can really dig into um, aspects and even uh, attending some of the, the workshops that I had um, knowledge about, I, I learned a few new bits. Um, so just uh, consider that. Uh, next slide. So we had 12 presentations that were specifically geared to uPortal, and there was a couple of overlapping general Aperio and open source uh, presentations as well. Uh, you'll see some familiar names of the presenters, uh, a couple of people from UW-Madison, Tim and, and Andrew, of course, a Christian, uh, also does an excellent uh, set of presentations, uh, very interesting and certainly entertaining. Um, and then we have a couple other people. I had the pleasure of doing a presentation with Cheryl uh, covering Sinclair College's AngularJS portal implementation, which is uh, based off of uPortal Home from UW-Madison. Had a lot of uh, positive feedback on that. Uh, so each, each one of those presentations was a little different. Everyone has a different presentation style and it's really enjoyable to see different perspectives on similar topics. So even though a lot of the topics we covered kind of uh, are, are, are presented in multiple sessions, uh, they're certainly different takes and worth attending. So I'm never bored, always interesting to, uh, to hear how people view different technologies. Some of the other things I want to point out is there's a number of BOFs. Since we're such an open community, um, it, it, those are really enjoyable uh, sessions where we get to talk about things uh, amongst ourselves. In particular, I'll go into some details about the, the uPortal roadmap BOF, uh, but um, a lot of good stuff happening in, in there. Uh, again, some of the similar technologies that are coming up, Soffits, uh, AngularJS in uPortal Home, and Material Design. Next slide. Uh, so, With, uh, with the uPortal roadmap in particular, just uh, some highlights. There was 12 items of interest uh, that were highlighted in the agenda. Uh, of course, it, we were all over the place. We had 21 attendees. It was a small room and it was packed full of people. A lot of new faces, uh, a lot of old faces, uh, not age-wise, just people who've been around for a while. Um, and so it was great to hear new perspectives and to uh, have discussions around these items uh, with the the people who have been in the community at, uh, for various durations. 
some of the items of interest, of course, we keep talking about uPortal 5, uPortal Start. Um, there's an interest in, in different layouts, in particular, kind of, you know, freshening up the front end of uPortal using AngularJS, uh, ReactJS, different technologies on the front end to, um, but not, not just technologies, but going beyond that and looking at how do we present uh, this information in a different way. So we're, we're really starting to talk about UI and, and UX concerns. Uh, but then on the opposite side, Dockerizing, getting uh, the deployment process in a very uh, clean, uh, tight uh, process. Uh, this is what Drew has been was talking about. Just just all these minor improvements that really add up, and, and they're not just minor. They're they're actually uh, major improvements. Things that have been kind of hanging hanging around for a while have been cleaned up recently, and it's been a real pleasure seeing those things happen. Uh, next, next slide. So that was just a one session boff. What we, we've been doing the last few years at the conference is getting together uh, what we're calling uPortal Collaboration Days. Uh, the last day of the conference is usually a half day. So we'll take the remaining uh, remainder of that day, um, get together usually for lunch or certainly right after lunch. And also on Thursday, a bunch of us get together and again, another Google Doc to uh, collect ideas and track uh, what we discuss. Uh, it was uh, also presented through Google Hangout so that anyone who was not at the conference could attend since this is such, we consider this such an important thing uh, in the community. Um, and we realize not everybody can attend the conference. Uh, if you were interested in participating and could make the conference, we'll we'll probably do something similar next year. Have a Google Hangout so that uh, you can participate. Uh, the nice thing about this is we take we took that session that boff and we were able to really deep dive, have real uh, conversations with countering views. Um, one of the things I really like about our community and, and collaborating is is just we have. Uh, very respectful discussions. Uh, everyone is willing to hear other people's views uh, and seriously consider them um, as as we move forward uh, as a group and, and working on uPortal. So there's a lot of passion um, in this community and it really shows by the number of people who stick around for these uh, extra uh, collaboration days. Um, next slide. And that's what it's really about. It's it's about getting together um, all these other projects with with Aperio, uh, just communicating in different ways. Um, we, we have lightning talks also. We didn't talk specifically about those sessions, but um, several, uh, in particular, Andrew Petro with several of us uh, also uh, spoke about topics of interest for just a few minutes, and that was very much enlightening. Uh, and getting together and just having a good time afterwards, making making that community really feel connected. And that's one of the best things about the Open Perio Conference. Next slide. Uh, so that's kind of my overview of the conference uh, for for me, um, kind of what, what happened, what I saw, um, kind of two additional items. Uh, the Jim Hillig, who's the uh, chair of the uPortal steering committee just wanted me to make sure that uh, people are aware that there's a uPortal uh, a Perio uPortal supporting subscription available. Here's the link to it. Um, this is this is not a Unicon subscription. This is a, a Perio just to help uh, the project kind of in an independent community way uh, directly uh, through the foundation. So if you're interested, follow this link and uh, you can read more about it. Next slide. And then the last thing related to conferences, we're seeing if there's interest in a developer conference in, in October. Uh, UW Madison has offered to host. Uh, we're looking at two to three days. And if you're interested, uh, go to the mailing list and, and let us know. Um, they said they'd be uh, happy to chair it. I'm interested in myself. Um, but they, you know, we can't call it a conference if it's just me showing up to UW Madison and chatting with the guys for a day or two. So if we can get a couple people committed, then uh, 
we'll we'll keep moving forward with that. And that's it for me. Hey all, this is Christian Murphy. I'm going to be talking about the sustaining engineering recap for this past quarter. Um, so first, let's get a high overview of um, kind of how we've been going with UPortal 5. Um, this is our slide from last quarter, kind of showing our status on it. Um, we finished up the Grail build and cleared out a lot of the open pull requests. Um, working through removing deprecated code and getting ready to decompose uPortal and set up the new uPortal start repository. Um, so this quarter, we've gotten through a majority of that. Um, done, 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 and done. Um, right now, we're just looking to um, finish up getting an upgrade to Spring 4, um, and that should conclude um, kind of the high-level efforts we're looking to do for uPortal 5. Um, looking into um, kind of the high-level overview of work we did, um, this does include everything, um, just kind of some high-level areas. Um, we focused a lot on refactoring packages. Um, Drew was doing a lot of awesome work in that area. Um, 71 commits in there, um, both from quarter one and quarter two um, to kind of complete out that effort. Um, we also worked on splitting out um, uPortal Start into its own repository. Um, both myself and Drew worked on that. Um, took about five commits and one major story to get that through. Um, as far as the Gradle transition, um, there have been quite a few stories in that area. Um, Drew, Seema, and myself have been working on that. 32 commits so far, and there's still um, a lot of great ideas we have in that area, so expect to see some more um, interesting changes for Gradle in the next quarter. Um, also this quarter, we've been working on testing improvements. Um, Seema's been doing some awesome work there, um, just improving um, the tests, and I'll get a bit more into that later. Um, and then also improving the documentation. Um, kind of giving the information that people need to get set up with uPortal, and then um, kind of getting the documentation for core uPortal and the very technical details um, split out from kind of the high level, here's how you adopt uPortal information. Um, so looking at the information for this quarter, um, we have had a lot, a lot of changes. Um, this is looking at the actual commits to our source control repository. Um, one of the most exciting things, to me at least, is seeing that this quarter um, there were actually more lines of code removed than there were added. Um, basically, with all the improvements we've been doing with um, both the Gradle-based build and with removing deprecated code, um, we have managed to significantly shrink the size of the uPortal code base while still keeping the same functionality. Um, Put in another way, um, it's easier to maintain, but you still get the same great features you know and love. Um, next slide. Um, and also, another exciting thing this quarter, um, we started looking into a little bit more of stability of the changes we did. Um, how many of the changes we started doing at the start of the quarter had gone unchanged by the end of the quarter, and found that um, a lot of our changes have been pretty stable. Um, there's not a lot of churn going on. We are quickly um, moving through stories and things are working as expected. Um, so kind of one of the areas I want to highlight is testing. Um, this is an area which one of our new contributors, Seema Tulili, has been working in. Welcome to the uPortal community, Seema. Um, and then an exciting area here, we've moved our test coverage, um, which basically is um, a set of automated requirements that we run with every contribution to make sure that the portal is still working. We've increased the amount of code we're checking from 20% to 22%, um, and we're going to be continuing to improve that in the next quarter. Um, and it's been focused a lot on testing the REST APIs in uPortal. Um, that's an area which um, UW-Madison with their AngularJS portal and um, Oakland with their React portal have been leveraging a lot. Um, we're expecting to see a bit more evolution in the area of REST APIs in the next quarter. Um, so we've been working on getting this tested out so we can quickly um, 
add new functionality in the REST APIs that people can leverage while still guaranteeing that the existing APIs that people are leveraging aren't broken. Um, another area which we've been working on a lot is documentation, uh, making sure that things are easy to understand and um, adopting uPortal is pretty straightforward. Um, I'd like to welcome new contributor Chris Beach, um, who's been doing some awesome work here. Um, as he's been ramping up on the uPortal project, he's been taking notes and getting that into the documentation. Um, just kind of giving some advice to people on some um, areas to be aware of and watch out for. Um, another great area that we've had improvement in um, was from Benito. We got documentation for F5. Um, from Andrew Petro, getting a list of the committers um, who can directly make changes um, within uPortal or merge changes, sorry. And some new documentation on um, how to work on uPortal with the integrated development environment uh, for myself. Um, another great change was Andrew Petro migrated in quite a few pages from our Confluence um, into the uPortal manual, so you can now find all this information in one place without needing to go from location, excuse me, location to location. Um, next slide. And then um, just a reminder for our um, clients on support, um, if you want to influence the direction of what we're doing with our sustaining engineering hours, um, go ahead and open up an S5 request and let us know um, an area you'd like us to look into, and we'll, um, we'll take a look at it. Um, next, I'm going to hand over to um, Marissa from University of Edinburgh and some of the exciting stuff that they've been working on. Over to you, Marissa. Hello. Can, can someone just say if they can hear me right now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, great, okay. Uh, can we go to the, all right. Yeah, so um, the project that we're doing now is about uh, transforming the way that students are experiencing our portal. So um, we had a consultancy review, um, I think it was, let's see, at least a year ago, two years ago now, I'm not entirely sure. Um, looking at a number of digital services that the university offers. And um, this was a quote from one of the student interviews that they did about my ad, which is our uPortal installation, saying, I can cope with my ads, but it took me a while to get used to it. So uh, next slide, please. So there are a number of problems that um, we're having with our current portal. Um, and it's, I think it's kind of interesting that a lot of these aren't necessarily technical problems. They're problems with the way that we are presenting this information to users. Uh, and I don't think that we're alone really in speaking to other universities and having these problems. So first, we've organized the structure of our portal around services rather than tasks. So for example, if we want to point users towards um, our LMS, Learn, then we say, here's Learn. Here's a big link to Learn at the top of the page. Um, but that means that the student needs to then figure out what they need to use certain services for. So we don't tell them, you know, well, do you want to submit your coursework? Click on this link. We're giving them a link to the service, not to the task that they want to do. So they have to understand that that service is linked to that task, which they don't necessarily understand. Also, we don't really support necessarily their user preferences. So um, We've now upgraded uh, to 4.3, so our mobile the, um, support is much better than it was before, but I think it could still be vastly improved. And we're not really doing a lot of things So we use a lot of our own internal acronyms or specialist vocabulary. Um, so for example, our student and course record system is called Euclid, which is actually an acronym. I can never even remember what that acronym stands for. So this is just another example of something where the name of the system is complex. It's not obvious. We're not using a descriptive name. So again, they have to understand that that 
service is for this particular purpose, which they don't necessarily know. Also, the information that we present is often generic. So we'll say, you may need to do this. Go talk to, you know, your school administrator to find out if you need to do that. Or you may need to do this. This may apply to you. Click here to find out. Um, you know, so we, again, we're putting the burden on them to kind of figure out whether this is applicable to them and decide whether they need to do anything about it. So the school then will be getting support calls from students saying, well, do I need to do this? I'm not really sure. Um, so it's just giving them an extra burden and creating confusion for them. Uh, next slide, please. So a uh, much shorter list of solutions about what we aim to do about this. So the main thing that we want to do is restructure our portal around student tasks and journeys. So grouping information together that's related to a particular task or journey and using the language that students are using to describe that task um, and or journey. Um, so that requires us to do a lot of research with students, which is one thing that we're doing just now. We also want to highlight items that are necessary for them to do so they understand what require urgent action. We want to allow users to interact how and when they want. So again, supporting preferences and different usage scenarios like mobile, offline, low bandwidth, um, using language that students understand. So using descriptive language and the language that students themselves would use, not our own internal vocabulary to describe a task and personalize what is being shown to the current user. So everything that the student is seeing is based around their current situation and is applicable for them. So rather than saying, you might need to do this, we are saying, yes, you definitely need to do this. We've looked at you know, your data. We know that you need to do this. So when we're telling you to do this task, this is for you. It's not a generic message that we're sending to you. Uh, next slide. So this is just showing some kind of visuals about ideas for what a um, new portal might look like. So this is showing, this is actually a design I did quite a while ago. So you could see I still got some service names in there, which I don't think we necessarily would want to have now. But it's kind of highlighting um, the tasks which are most urgent for them at the top. So today, what they have to do today. So this is actually now, they can all actually access a lot of this information already, but it's not all in one place. So their timetable, the map, um, all of that isn't in the same location. They can't look at it together. So if they wanted to create that type of view, they have to manually bring that information together in one place, which is what students do for a lot of these tasks at the moment. They're manually bringing that information together. Um, next slide. This is showing what um, a kind of notifications panel might look like using the uh, notifications portlet, but presenting it in a slightly different way. So um, we're working on kind of notifications backbone in Edinburgh, which we talked about at the Open Ontario conference, and we're now looking at bringing into incubation uh, as a product. Um, so. The, it's showing a list of notifications highlighting due dates, so organizing according to the due date for when they need to do a particular thing, um, you know, giving them some kind of visual hierarchy about what they need to do. Um, sorry, next slide. And yes, uh, source code coming soon. Um, we're working on that. This is another one showing a kind of more recent uh, design that I put together in Sketch. So it's just showing, again, some more recent ideas about uh, ideas for what the portal might look like. So it's kind of a representation of what I had on the last slide. But you could see one thing that, new thing, which we've added in is this kind of study abroad box, which is in the top right corner. Uh, so this is an idea that we had talked about, which I think is kind of interesting. So this was about, again, looking at somebody's status and current situation to determine whether we want to show them a piece of information. So in this situation, we might want to actually look at their current situation and say, well, hey, we can tell from your current contacts that this piece of information about study abroad is actually applicable to you. So we're going to show that to you and highlight it to you because we think this will be interesting to you. So again, it's kind of using their status to create a more personalized uh, experience. So that's all from me. So I'm not sure who I'm handing over to now. 
Actually, it's back to Stephen. Thank you so much, Marissa. That was very informative. I really appreciate it. All right, so the last segment that we have to discuss um, is our Q&A. Uh, Seema will, as I had mentioned, she's documented uh, any questions that have gone unanswered. So we'll turn it over to Seema briefly. She'll ask the questions, and as a group, uh, or as an internal Unicon group, we'll answer those questions to the best of our ability. Take it away, Seema. Um, this is Seema. So there are actually three questions which I documented, and uh, first couple of questions were answered by Andrew. Uh, the last question I see in the chat is regarding the source code. Uh, Andrew Petra asked the question, source code coming to public light soon for notification backbone. Uh, yeah, so as I was saying, we are going through the process of releasing that. So it's still on the way, I promise. Okay. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you. And uh, Bruce asks, like, how far are we from having the Angular JS front end as the production option supported by Apiero? And I and Andrew actually answered uh, that question in the chat as not far at all. Thank um, you, Andrew. Another question, Andrew Petras, is U Portal Home in scope for Unicorn's open source support for U Portal or not? If we can't answer the question now, we'll table it and then provide an answer at a later time through our public website and blog post. Uh, uh, just to comment on that, I, we, sure. we do have, we have had some uh, requests to support a uh, uPortal Home with the client. Um, that was Sinclair. Uh, it was uh, not part of the base subscription. Um, uh, but it was uh, additional uh, contract work. Next question. Um, Bruce actually asked a question, is that this year? I, I'm not sure what he means by that. <coughs> <coughs> uh, Can you repeat the question? I'm going to yeah. I'm going to speak uh, try to answer Bruce's question uh, because I am in a speaking role, uh, despite the fact that I think there are others on the call who may who may know more. Uh, I believe the uh, U Portal Home is perfectly available and viable uh, right now uh, from Wisconsin and is in deep in uh, several calls and iterations into an Aperio incubation process. Thank you, Drew. Next question, Tina? Uh, yeah, I, that's the, that was the last question. Okay. Anything else that the group would like to discuss? We've got seven minutes left. Oh, um, I was going to say, because we are looking to enter incubation, um, for notifications backbone, if there are any other universities that are interested, or I guess anyone that's interested um, in using the notifications backbone, because we have to have adopters as part of the incubation process, then just get in touch with us. So I think Mar my boss, Martin, has spoken to a few people at Open Aperio, but if there's anyone else that um, is keen to get involved, then just let me know, I guess. Thank you, Marissa. Looks like we had a couple of additional comments come in through the chat room. Yeah, are we Bruce, good? Yeah, I think we are good. Bruce actually asked, is uPortal Home a branch of portal source code? And Andrew said uPortal Home is its own repo. Uh, okay. And Jupiter said uPortal Home is an optional add-on module for use with the base uPortal. So I don't see any questions. There is just a general discussion going on. Uh, I would be happy to read that. 
Okay, thank you, Seema. Okay, so I guess we can go ahead and wrap it up. I'd like to thank everyone for attending and Marissa for participating. That was a very involved community spotlight um, and uh, exciting information that you presented. I really appreciate that. I learned a lot from that. Um, as a reminder, this presentation will be available via our YouTube channel within the upcoming weeks. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on our public website um, in addition to um, an accompanying blog that will highlight um, various sections within the presentation as well. Um, we encourage you to share the presentation once it's available um, with your groups. I think there was a lot of informative information that those that weren't attending could potentially gain some knowledge on and, and value from. Um, outside of that, again, I appreciate everyone attending, and I hope everyone has a great day and look forward to speaking to everyone in another three months. All righty. Thank, Thank you. Much. Have a great day. Everyone. See you guys. Thank you.